Ben, welcome to the Confluence Podcast. It's great to have you. And today we're going to be talking about Varus and I think a lot of the things that have been going on behind the scenes leading up to and during development of Varus. Maybe you could just start off and explain what Varus is. And I, you know, I, the stuff that I see you guys reposting on LinkedIn is absolutely incredible. It has to make you just like grin with pride that people are creating amazing things with your tools. So tell tell everybody what it is if they haven't heard of it, if they've been living under a rock, uh, and we'll just go from there. For sure, yeah. So it's good to be back, uh, or at least maybe this is the first in this format. Uh, right. But yeah, good to be here. Yeah, so Verus, Verus is, a, I guess, render is, is the way we, we you could say it, but it's AI renderer, and it uses uh, diffusion-based rendering to take your uh, model, your geometry, and diffuse it so that it actually re uses machine learning models to actually get a rendition for you. And it's the way it does that is it, it denoises the image and then it adds noise back. And it essentially takes the way it adds that noise back as per trade material. And it uses a prompt to guide what you want to see in the image. So you could have something like, okay, here's a building, render it during summer or winter, or, you know, make it a log cabin. So those sorts of like ridiculous you know, prompts you could put in there and you don't have to be as ridiculous, but it will actually respect that. It will actually try to get, okay, this part of the building looks like it could be that. So it's starting to form that way and then it becomes that. It becomes a long cabin part of the building. So um, it's it's a so it's, it's an application that's integrated within SketchUp, Revit, a Rhino. We have a beta version of Vectorworks. It also has a standalone and Forma. So we have all those different uh, applications that we're extending that, you know, in the AC space. Yeah. And and I just want to throw out there like you don't have to model all that stuff to get right. that kind of output, right? And that's to me where this really becomes a decision making or ideation kind of prototyping tool very much which is very different from traditional rendering, right? Rendering it was was always like a later stage or it was a visualization technique a lot of times to use for communication with clients with pinups in the office, things like that. And now it's kind of shifted the weight of the potential of a rendering, quote unquote, rendering application. Right. Because you could feed it a generic piece of geometry and it fills in the details magically. Uh, and just as right. a personal anecdote, I have a model of a, a house that I was working on as an architect and was using Veris to... To, you guys have these amazing little presets, right? Which are like yeah. with snow and grassy hills and, and just to kind of show off because not everybody necessarily knows what to prompt the first time they're going to prompt this thing. So you give them a little bit of a shortcut, head start. Right. I clicked one of those buttons and I got to see this house in the snow. It happens to be a house in the mountains. I showed it to my family and they were blown away right? Just blown yeah. away. And yeah, to get so back cool. to that, the images that yeah. I see you guys sharing on LinkedIn yeah. in these various posts, it's absolutely incredible. So people should definitely check out, I, do you guys have a hashtag that you try to use to kind of group these together on social posting? There are AI usually, but a lot of times okay. I search Veras because, you know, that's easier. It's just that one's a very common one. So you might not yeah. get it. So like Veras render, that's another one. It resonates yeah. with me, uh, Ben, I don't know if you know, but my personal history is I started a company called ArcVision years ago, which was actually in the services business doing visualization. Right. And what's interesting, I think about what you're tapping into is it was kind of counterintuitive that a lot of the earliest stage of where visualization was wanted or needed was actually just to, um, to service the customer on for them to go out and market raise money, move a project along. And of course you want that to be as photorealistic as possible. And that was counterintuitive to the, the design right. process hasn't even started. So I need, I want hyper realism mm -hmm. just to get the project moving along and then it's going to go to zero and then some design process starts that actually, you know, is the real thing. But I, I could imagine that you're uh, definitely able to help fill that gap in those earliest stages of we just need the customer needs something to go, you know, we're not designing, we're just trying right. to sell, right? Move the yes. project along. Yeah, that, that also reminds me of, or just back in when I started in this industry too, is uh, I I had a course and it was like just drawing with like Prismacolor and markers and pen and actually just getting renditions of that and using 
all sorts of like different media and you have one render and it's like hand done and this is it. So take this render and, and, you know, you'll, we'll replicate it the same way. And it's just <laughs> of this perspective and you can have five different iterations that have a complete different color palette. It's much more analogous to that, where it's like on the ideation side where we're like, okay, let's just look at this and explore ideas. And yes, it looks pretty photorealistic. And that is that counterintuitive part where it's like people get kind of set into like, this is, you know, they get married to it, but it's also very powerful. Like it could be that, uh, but yeah, it's, it's kind of more like that. It's like this kind of expert painter and that learned how to paint really well on a fine pixel by pixel, uh, way where, you know, it could produce these, these images. And then, uh, Evan, you were talking about earlier about, uh, how, uh, you were kind of using it for like personal project and just uh, testing that out. It's funny cause, um, Bill, uh, he's in the process of, of, uh, purchasing a house, uh, our CEO. And uh, he was doing the same thing. It's like, uh, he's just taking pictures of the house and looking at it like, okay, what I, I want this, uh, I know this kind of dated and this, you know, the kitchen looks like this, but what could it look like? So just like, just kind of having, you know, the whole, you know, the bones are there, the skeletons there, you know, just changing the finishes of the building. And he was playing the dance, sharing it, it, it with our team. And it's pretty fantastic like that. You could do that. Uh, and yes, it's not replicated where it's kind of like a traditional renderer where you kind of, okay, you have the 3D model, you set all your views uh, or your camera and you have your materials, your lighting and all that. And then you could, you know, make a video out of it, uh, and, and start to, you know, it's every, everything is prescriptive, but you have to be that expert and you have to devote that time to, to get there. It's, it's not reproducible right now. Could become there soon. We'll see how, how things mm -hmm. are working. Mm -hmm. But, um, right now it's kind of really powerful for that ideation uh, stage where you could just explore ideas and just kind of see what, what could look good and just kind of have that inspiration. It's like your, like Pinterest board right within your actual project not not just kind of going online to find those inspiration images like what just take those images and put them there i i find yeah. that is a super useful way to use these kinds of tools which is stop hunting for hours online for something that it represents what you're looking for and just prompt what you're looking for and create it co-create it with these tools uh, so obviously it's using your guidance to get there and you will get better at prompting it, and it will give you better results as, by doing that. Um, but but you're you're learning a, a new way of working. And even for like PowerPoint presentations, instead of going out and looking for imagery that I I need for a PowerPoint, I will use right. Dolly three to do that with prompting or Mid Journey, right? Because it gives me something unique, number one. It gives me something that really kind of focuses on what I needed to focus on because it's very difficult to find stock photography or imagery that may be exactly what you're looking for. It's a, and a fantastic use for that. And now we can do that with architectural images. As a designer myself, I also want to throw out that, like what Randall was talking about a minute ago, has always been a really difficult thing for architects to deal with on the client side and it's not getting easier, which is it looks done. It looks done, done right. when you see these images and clients don't know what it takes to get there. And so right. reverse engineering something that you may come up with during this ideation process into actual architecture is the skill of an architect. And it takes a new conversation point with a client to get there now. And I think uh, that that is something that we're kind of working our way through on the design side, which is how yeah. to talk to people about this stuff, because like there is your log cabin in the woods. It's right, right there. It looks done. Yeah. And it's like, nope, now we actually have to do everything it takes to turn that into actual architecture. Um, and we've always had this issue on one way or yeah. another with with rendering. Right. It's like, well, it, like my wife and I did a project for my sister in law and she like we had Revit floor plans. And she thought it was done. It's like, we haven't even started. And how do you communicate that? Because it was right. just space layouts. It's just adjacencies. It's, right. it's like, does this feel right? We're trying to figure out if we're going in the right direction. And, and they're thinking, because they don't, they're not well-versed in this, man, it's, it's done, right? Can we, let's get started on the project. And it's like, oh, my gosh, totally. we have so much work to do. And this is that on steroids. And I just want to throw all that out because these are the kinds of conversations that architects are having amongst themselves on yeah. their teams as they're pinning stuff up on the wall and sending images out to clients. And, um, I mean, you're, you're probably getting a lot of heat even back, I would imagine, as a developer of a tool like this, like, you're killing our process that we've gotten so good at. It's com it's changing it, right? You're pulling the rug out from under our feet. I bet you you hear all kinds of weird stuff like that. Now, I want to I want to touch on that. Like, I think it's, I really do think it's a co-authoring approach, regardless. Mm. Like, 
you talked about communication with a client. Yes, that's great. Like as architects and as designers, you can look at an image of a building and know the project you're working on and visualize it in your own mind, what you envision that to be because you, you're trained and you've done it so many times that that's kind of like, right. you, you know, you could read a floor plan and you can understand what the layout is with the client. Like it's emotional. Like you can't depict that, you know, simply by showing a floor plan or like how, how things are. If you actually show a, a imagery of that, like it's, it's kind of the equivalent of teleporting what, how you're thinking in something that's, you know, something a bit more consumable, something that could actually be interpreted and, and, and invoke that emotion with a client. You can see, okay, from these five very different ideas, it seems like you're gravi gravitating towards this thing. And then, okay, what is that reverse, reverse engineering process? I think that process actually is also creative because you're still kind of doing that when you're kind of going deep into your mind to kind of sculpt out or, or, or you know, re retract more things that you've learned over the past and compose this new project. It's kind of similar to that. I think that that kind of synergy is still there, but at least you're kind of have a much better communication and more uh, connectivity with the client. So I think, I think it's a really kind of, it's not taking away like, okay, like now we don't get to render. Like, I think it's a different process. It's actually a hybrid thing where you're using it even for yourself, actually, as a designer, you can use it as an inspiration. Like, oh, I didn't think of, you know, that kind of materiality here, but okay, how could it really work? And then you kind of design and you build a building and you design the building in such a way that you, you know, you can put those pieces of the puzzle together properly. Yeah. So maybe, uh, maybe Ben, you can take us back to, uh, just in the development of this, when, what's the backstory? When, did, when did it happen? Was there a, when did the technology uh, yes. present itself? And then ultimately how did that evolve into the product that it is and, and how did you all think about that? Of course. Yeah. So we think in 2022, I believe, uh, it's when we had like mid journey, mid journey V1 come out. And everyone was super excited. And we saw these kind of like painterly, like ghost-like imagery. It's like V1, V2. And then during that time, I was like very intrigued by it. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. So I made an account and, and started to play with that. And it was awesome. It was very fun. And I was using it for, I think we were working on Glyph at the time, or not Glyph, another product. And we were trying to come up with a, come up with a logo. So we're like prompting ideas in there to like, okay, what's the logo going to be like? So it was a really fun process. And then Stable Diffusion came out. Uh, at a similar time with, and it was, you know, lower quality was pretty, you know, people were, but it was exciting because it's open source and now a lot of people could build on that. And that's, we build up, that's what we built on too. Uh, but back then it was very basic and it was a lot of different, like very poor quality uh, imagery, but then they upgraded to 1.4, 1.5. And then uh, I think at one point they also added image to image. And then I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Image to image. What can you do with image to image? And this is before like, you know, depths and, uh, other kind of models came out, uh, or candy models. And so what we wanted to just play out was like, okay, like what if we get the idea was just to, to test, what if we get like uh, a Revit image that looks close to realistic, like the materials are better. You make the lighting better. Like what if it's like a close enough, like, like digital image that looks kind of like a render that's digital and just a little bit, like let AI change it ever so slight. What does it look like? Will it look better? Can it fit, you know? correct those edges where it looks very like digital and just add that little dirt just to make it look at, like almost like a photo. And that's what, you know, before anything, like all the other models came out, we just play with that. We had like really cool results like, wow, this is cool. I mean, it still looks like Revit or whatever, cause we're testing it in Revit first, but it looks better than Revit. <laughs> it was so bare bone, but that was, you know, so we already started developing like something, some ideas with that. Okay. This is great. And that was like middle of uh, 2022. Uh, and so, and then, um, control net came out and like other models came out I'm like, okay, let's try that. And let's, let's add, and we already kind of had the pipeline for that where we, cause we started to tinker with it and we started to add all, all those, you know, other technologies that's being developed. And so as we were adding that, uh, really started to become a product. Like, like actually this is like, good. like we should like, you know, like, let's see what people think. And then I think at the beginning of, of January, uh, in, uh, I think it was January 2nd or something like that. Uh, we wanted to get it before the, the year ended, but you know, the holidays and then like, uh, oh, we're so close. But anyways, uh, January of, uh, um, 2023, we launched the first version for, for Revit. And it was very basic. It's just like, uh, you know, limited resolution and, 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 you know, uh, but it was really cool. It was like a really cool start. And then as things have developed and things have, uh, upgraded over time, we just kind of kept on adding and started to build our, like more of our own 
uh, even our own models and we started to train and we, we started to kind of really finesse the process and uh, kind of take more, more on ownership of it. But that's kind of how like it's nascency. That's how it started. We just kept on tankering and like, okay, let's just see what this is. This is fun. And, and uh, yeah, that's kind of how it uh, started. So Ben, can you show everybody what this actually looks like? I think we've, we've talked about it, we've alluded to it, but I think now would make a lot of sense to just show how it's working. Um, and then we can get into kind of how you got to this point. Sure. Sounds great. So, um, I have a SketchUp model. I like to have a lot of SketchUp. So, uh, it's a button on the ribbon here or on the tool, uh, panel. And so as soon as we click that, uh, UI opens and then uh you can see our our model in here change the resolution and these are the presets that you were talking about earlier uh evan right so we have a few different presets here so if i click this one you know it um it starts off right away one thing that we've learned with our helix product is um and that's our kind of interoperability from sketchup to revit so it brings in uh, sketch geometry into native bim was just the challenge to get people as few clicks as possible to like a success just like okay get me like, I want to click one button and I get something. It's not the right thing, but it's something. And so we've learned that. And that's how kind of we added this uh, explore mode where, uh, we've learned from that application where even in this one as well, we've kind of seen how people would like write different prompts in the beginning. Like they just wouldn't know what to write. Like, I just, I don't know, I'm lost for word. Yeah, so, you know, the, totally. the rendition doesn't look great. If you don't put anything in, in there, you have to kind of define something in there. Uh, we try to help that a little bit and it's something, you know, some, you could get some, some decent results now without any prompt. But it's, it really does help guide the, the rendering as soon as you add some prompts. So this page is kind of like that, where it's like, okay, this is that single one button click where you could just, uh, so I'll just try a few of these. I'll just click them. I'll just go for it. I there think it's go. really important to just sit on what you just said for a moment. Doing something that makes it as easy as possible for somebody to see some results that matter to them. It's their model, right? It's not like these presets are some model that you're supplying. No, it's applying these presets to whatever I give the Veris application to, to work with as an underlay, basically. And it it immediately gives me, as the user, permission to play with this. And I think that is super important from a development standpoint to kind of reiterate that message. It's like, what do you do when you don't know what to do? Oh, there's these buttons right here, and that's a great place to start. And and just for people who are developing apps, I, I I see this come up over and over and over again. Like, what would it look like if it was easy? Because we've all been through on this call, right? What does the V-Ray interface look like? It's like, are right. you serious? It's like flying a jet, right? It's 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 got the the dialogue boxes and the settings and the the sliders and the words I've never seen before as a first time user, and it can't we. We know what it takes to be a an expert V-Ray user with the materials and the lighting and all the settings. And then there's something like this, which is, this is a completely different paradigm. And you're making it as easy as possible to get started with that. We talk about that as right. time to value, right? What's your time to value for that mm. customer so they get their kind of taste of success as quickly as possible? Uh, just a quick backstory. I used to like in the early, early days, early 2000s, I was teaching at the university and I used to teach 3D studio and it was like, I don't know if it was me or the students, but it seemed like every year that I taught it, it got hurt. It took longer and longer to get them to the point where they could actually just do anything. And then SketchUp came around and I'm like, man, the time to value is just like nothing. They can start right. you know, in, in 10 minutes start seeing some success. So I agree. And, and I think, you know, what you're doing here, Ben, is, is, is a key to success. Show some instant value and then they'll give you more time, right? These are just amazing. Like, let's just, they're magic. These are just magic. Like, I, you're smiling. I'm, I know, like, you feel this feeling all the time. But, but it's literally magic when people see these for the first time. No matter what you feel about AI and the training and who's getting paid and who like that, that's we've we've talked about those things on this podcast, right? The governance, the ethics. Uh, there's so many things around this, and this is this is seriously magical. And I just wanted to also point that out that these images that your that that your tool is presenting us with immediately give us that emotional connection potential to to respond in real time and i think that is an extremely valuable tool to have 
as a designer. Totally agreed. And it is, it is very magical. Like it never ceases to amaze me. I'm like, oh, that looks cool. <laughs> the other one also looks cool. So that's kind of part of it, uh, part of the process of, of uh, developing the tools. So like fun and so, uh, uh, you know, there's so much fulfillment to just kind of like play with it. And so like, we just keep on building on it. Um, one thing that you said earlier too, that I want to also kind of come back just slightly to is, uh, as you know, with the presets, once you kind of have those presets on here, you could go back to any one of these kind of renditions and you could see kind of all the settings that were used. So mm -hmm. if you change your, your image here, it updates the prompt that was used for that. And then you can kind of see, okay, this is how that was written. Uh, and like, I think us as humans is we're pretty good at like reverse engineering or not just reverse engineering, but if, if you learning by mimicry. So like, if you see like, okay, it looks like those ideas are come out separate and those phrases are built that way for each comma, you kind of start to read that without even needing a, you know, a tutorial, like, oh, okay, that's how that, that prompt was. Cause you can write mm -hmm. anything. You might write a narrative and, and com a conversation like, but it's not, you can see the examples. It doesn't do that. So you could, we're pretty intuitive creatures where you could like, okay, I could see how it's being written. So I think that was kind of part of that. I think you're also talking about Randall Warrior. Like we want to get to that aha moment where it's like the first click and then it's not the right image yet, but you got something with your data. Like it's your project and it looks interesting. Yeah. I think okay, now let's make it look like what you want it to look like. And you've seen an example of, you know, of what that input, what it produces. So if you wanted to change this, you know, like, let's say I don't want a timber building. I want a monolithic concrete building, right? Then I'll render a few of those. Then I, cause I know that's my project. I'll just change the parts. Like if you have something you, you were good at like picking up certain parts that are incorrect or what you want. And so you just change the part that you want to what you think it should be for your context. And then, yeah, that's, so that was also part of that, uh, part of that kind of thinking how we, we built like those two kind of menus where it's just like a separate menu altogether. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, there you go. We have a model. I think people will give you infinite amount of time if they got that first hit of value. Yeah. Cause then they will, they will stay in here forever, maybe longer than they should. Right. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, right. I was going to say dopamine. <laughs> I, I, you, you said hit of value, but hit of dopamine is what I was thinking. It's just <laughs> as, as somebody who is literally addicted to creating images of architecture, right. Uh, this right. is, this is feeding that, that addiction in a, in a very interesting way. Right. So I'll, I'll just have me reframe this a little bit. Just going to move it ever so slightly this way. Very cool. There you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm gigging out here, even just by, by this project. Okay, I'm liking the concrete look. Let's get a few more of them. <laughs> so yeah, this is this is what it's like being on a Zoom call with you, Ben, right? Like, <laughs> we're, we're supposed to be talking about this, but you're doing that on the side. Yeah, <laughs> you're, sorry. you're not distracted by email. You're, you're not distracted by email. You're you're actually doing renderings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, uh, Ben, can you, uh, can, like how many images are people creating when they're like working on a project like this? Do you have any stats on like, they create 10 variations or a thousand variations or what does that look like? Yeah. So, uh, we do have optional analytics, uh, that, that we do collect that kind of stuff. Uh, we don't collect the images or we don't train on the images. That's a lot. Those questions come up a lot. Sorry. Yeah. I'm going to get to the answer. Uh, but in the same vein, like these are just things in my memory that come up. Mm -hmm. Um, but like what we've observed is like people like to stay within like one shot and just explore that like a hundred images or 200 images. Uh, it was more, more images kind of in the very beginning because the quality wasn't that great. And every like 20th one was a really good one. So then you're like just going there. Cause like, I want that good one, but now almost every rendition is, is pretty decent. So that number kind of came down a bit. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, like we have a few different, like we have our forums and we see some people, how their processes, some people render like the scene without any objects cause they want like a baseline and then they want to build on that. Okay. I just want my ceiling and like no furniture for an interior scene, let's say. And then you build on that, your furniture, you, you build other pieces and then you have control over all the layers if you wanted to, uh, to kind of just keep different parts and different pieces. And that's actually what we already offer already inside the application, but well, it's kind of limited right now, which we're expanding to, but yeah, to answer the, the original question, it's, it, uh, quite a few different images and sometimes changing on and off a different kind of aspects of the, of the, of the image and using the seed, like which the seed is, uh, uh lets you kind of keep the same. If you were to, it's prescriptive, uh, it's deterministic. So if you were to render the same scene again and you turn the seat on, then it will produce the same results. So then if you make minor changes, let's say you remove a door, everything else will stay the same, but you'll have that rendition 
of the version with that door removed. So if I want to do it for this one, for example, uh, and I hide, I don't know, part of this, uh, you could, you could see how, uh, that will change. Let's see. I want to kind of hide a significant part of the building. Let's see if this could work. Okay. That's probably good enough. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave the same, uh, um, seed here and then I'll, I'll, I'll render it one more time without, uh, okay, so I'll use this one actually. Okay. There you go. So, I mean, it's going to take a second to render, but yeah, so to, to the original question, like I think people like explore and try different, uh, um, kind of renditions to get kind of that design and then they kind of finesse uh, in like, let's say you like most of the image, then you render more different parts of that image. So, yeah. So when it came to you designing this tool, this application, uh, as, and it, it, it looks the same, no matter what tool you're using as kind of the host, right? It's like you see the same presets on the on the side you see the same row of imagery across the bottom maybe take us through the layout of this and and why you decided to do it the way that you did as as you developed the app sure so a bit of a background my my background is also from architecture i went to school for that and uh, actually sketchup was the first application i learned uh then i learned rhino and then uh, when I got hired to work in the firm, I learned Revit. So uh, that's kind of was my journey. Uh, but throughout that, even in school, like I was uh, always uh, excited about renditions and like I always got a better CPU to be able to render, uh, you know, high resolutions just for presentations. So that was always a, a thing that I was really drawn to. Uh, and so as I, in, in my uh, career, uh, when I was kind of more in, in that architect role, I would, uh, you know, produce a lot of visualizations and do that. So I've used tools like Lightroom. I've used Photoshop a lot and all those elements kind of, I think affected kind of the layout of this. So totally. if you look at the bottom room, that's totally, uh, affected Lightroom. by Lightroom, like Lightroom, yeah. yep. <laughs> you can see it. Can... Yep. So, uh, that, that's how that works. Uh, the Photoshop side is kind of something that we're actually bringing in, but we have kind of part of it is, is we're about to release this week is just a layer system where you want to build your image and you kind of like, you know, this part of the image and not this part of the image. So for example, we could do that even now. This is a, uh, let's see if we added, uh, let's say, I'm just gonna make this part something ridiculous, like some kind of maybe red material. For the sake of it, I might just call it red or something. Red. Okay. And you'll see that, um, you know, you could, you layer your composition when you get to that design. So. Those kind of elements and those tools that I've used in the past, uh, and other people in our, in our, in our team used in the past kind of start to find their, their way into, mm -hmm. into how the application, the interface is, is built. Um, so yeah, so if I go over it a little bit, we have these three tabs at the top. The first one is kind of like that onboard, like almost, uh, beginner, like you're, you're learning it, but we didn't want to just keep it for the, for the beginner because like I go back to it, like when I want to try something very, like a quick start. So. We didn't want to make it just, you know, we wanted to have more use out of it. So it's very simple. You're not inundated with any, you know, any dials or any, any sliders. Then compose the ideas that, okay, you are taking kind of ownership of this, this, this design and you know what you want, you know, the materials you want. So you can start to explore a bit more, um, uh, more restricted. You kind of with certain materiality and then refine is, okay, I'm set with this view. I like most of it, but I want to start to change it. So this is where you can't change the resolution anymore. You actually, this is like your Photoshop mode where you're getting in there and you're kind of making slight changes in here and everything that we're adding to this kind of tab. And there's a lot of things that are this coming is kind of geared towards that, where it's helping with, with getting that design, uh, much closer to what your vision is. So, and then and at I the think bottom, one of the you things, have... oh, just, just before you go on here, I think one of the things that, that really stands out to me is that this tool is based on workflows of an architect, right? And and one of the things that I think we've all struggled with in the past with renderers is it produces one image or, or an animation at a time, and then it's kind of left up to you and your folder layout, folder structure on your drive to kind right. of flip, flip between images. Right. And that's where Lightroom or Photoshop kind of changed the game, right? Because they're really workflow-based tools and and rendering is a workflow so it gives you the tools you need when you're in that mode of working i think that makes a lot of sense to kind of think about the end user as a developer 
and what they're doing in this process and what tools they need at their fingertips right then and and that you're you're pulling that off here because when I'm ideating, I want to look at all the snapshots and I want to flip right. back and forth and see what I like about this one and what I don't like about this one because that's going to help me craft the next prompt for the next one potentially or refine an area. And all of those have to do with my workflow because that's the mode I'm in when I'm doing this kind of thing. Exactly. That's You, could, you said it better than me. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. <laughs> this episode is made possible with support from Chaos Enscape. This is the perfect time to set good intentions and resolutions for the months ahead. Whether you aim to solve your design challenges faster, run your projects more smoothly, make quicker decisions, or share immersive walkthroughs with the click of a button, here's some good news. You won't need any resolutions. Chaos Enscape has the best 3D workflow solution. Chaos Enscape is the industry-leading real-time visualization plugin that is 100% fast, 100% easy, and fully integrated into your favorite design tools. It is the trusted choice of over 500,000 monthly users across 150 countries. Starting today, you can get a 20% discount on fixed and floating annual licenses. Just head to chaos-enscape.com and use code RES24 at checkout. That's chaos-enscape.com using code RES24 at checkout to supercharge your design workflow. Thanks to Chaos Enscape so much for their support of this episode. And now let's get back to the conversation. Yeah, you start like low, like big, broad, uh, big, large gamut. It's mm-hmm. like, I don't know. Like, I want to try 10 things. And uh, and then, okay, I like one of those 10 things. Okay, now let's try, you know, 10 variation, variations of that. Okay, I like this variation. Let's make this the real thing. So that's yeah. kind of the, exactly, that's the process. It's just like architecture. You start way back and then you zoom in and then you zoom out and then you zoom in and then at some point you decide, okay, this is the direction and we're going to zoom in more and more and refine and refine and refine and it makes a lot of sense for the actual user who's using this application, I think, because it, it feels pretty natural then at that point. It's also like diffusion. It denoises and denoises. Mm. Sorry, I had to do that to add that in there. It gets clear. The image gets clearer and clearer and clearer. Uh, t- to what it needs to be. So, yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. So they build the, uh, this ability to mask and layer and build that up. Uh, it sounds like that's close. Uh, was that, uh, driven by, uh, user requests? Uh, how, how did that feature, how did y'all decide that that should be what, what you do next? Yeah. There's quite a few different examples of how, of uh, even personal examples. Like I would take f- from five images and I would go in Photoshop and, and, you know, get elements from each one. That's coming essentially. So you just don't have to leave the application to get that. Let's say you have five or these three images and you like part of one, but not part of the other one. I want to just blend the two and I want to keep the parts that I like. And then in Photoshop, you know, it's kind of super powerful. You could do anything you want, but in Photoshop, you have to know like, okay, where you add the mass, you know, the feather of the mask and where, where it is in the, in the channels, the alpha channels. So you have to do all of that and you have to kind of know how those things are. And our interface is just, you know, simple. It's like, okay, you know what you want. You want to combine these two images, there's just two buttons and you don't have to learn that. Um, so we've seen that actually with a lot of our end users, users already doing that. Like they're, they're taking their images and they're, they're going to, to Photoshop and doing that. So, okay. It makes sense. Okay. It seems like this is something that, that you're doing. Let's just add it in there. Uh, so, and also personal, personal experience too. Like I, I think I've done that, uh, quite a few times. Uh, and I think there's a third one, but I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting. Uh, there's a third example on that. Um, are you able? Yes. And I'm not as familiar with this, with this tech bin, but are you able to separate material choices from lighting and say, I want that material, but it needs to now be consistent. Cause that, you know, Photoshop, that was always the challenge was, you know, you could end up with mixed lighting and, you know, yeah, you could collage stuff together, but, um, are you able to control those separately and then use those as separate passes or separate inputs, I guess? Yes, we could, we could do that. In the live version that we have right now, we don't have that, but uh, not so much on the lighting side, but the material side, uh, definitely on the material side, the different maps and channels that you can have for all the different materials that are present in the scene. That's uh, something that uh, is actually very, uh, manip- we could manipulate that a lot actually. And that's very powerful. Yeah. So, I was just noticing, uh, even as you flip through those, the, you know, the lighting, the sh- where shadows were, were different. So if all of a sudden one part of the image, you said, I really like this. But maybe what you really like is the 
material choices or the way that that right. was affected, can you, can you end up re basically re-rendering, holding the material there and changing it over here with consistent lighting and those things? It seemed like natural evolution yeah. of this would be that kind of granularity. Yeah. So with, with the lighting, if you wanted, like if it's, uh, you know, overcast, that's kind of nice because then it just blends in. So if you're kind of have that part of your prompt, then you don't have to worry so much about it. But if it's direct lighting, and that is also something that, something that we've seen other users do because of the, uh, the base, you actually have the shadows, the hot shadows, and you know, we have to include in the prompt what that means, what those, you know, what is that geometry? Is that carpet changing its color or is it actually a shadow of the carpet? So you kind of have to add that in the prompt. That's what you've seen. And per that, you could then, you know, allow the engine to, okay, I understand it's the same material, but you're kind of rendering the shadow. So then you can have consistent views. Let's say if you have like a sun through a window uh, coming through and you, you, you wanted to render just different materials, but you still want the same shadows in the same spot that we, we've seen success in that. One of the, one of the benefits that you mentioned there is just not having to learn another tool or know another tool to the level of expertise that you need it. Are there additional benefits to you doing all of this in Verus, like giving those abilities to a user, like, like blending, like you mentioned, feathering and masking and all those things. Are those things being taken care of then by Verus at a, at a, at a pretty nice level to, so where I, I feel like I'm going to be pretty happy with the outcome without knowing the depths of Photoshop to get those kinds of results if I had to do it manually. Yeah, I actually changed uh, in the dev version here, uh, but that's exactly what we're working on uh, this week. I think I could show you a GIF though. It's really cool. <laughs> I wonder if we, we recorded that GIF. Uh, let's see. Well, yes, yes. The, the answer is yes. And I don't know if I have a visual for it yet. Again, this will be probably released by the time uh, this, this airs. Uh, let's see, I think I have. Maybe this. Okay, I'll show you this one. It's a bit uh, early, so to, you have to forgive it. Because I think it's really fun to, to look at, and it's really uh, interesting how it how it blends things. And that's exactly uh, what you want. Let's say you want to um, talking about lighting. Let's say you wanted to just change the sky to something that's very different. The way you would want to blend that, it matters. Like you really want to. Yeah. It affects wanna, the you know. the building, right? It's not just the sky. It's it's the lighting. It's the shadows. It's everything. Right. So here, I will do something a little bit scary, but I think it's going to work. So this is going to get reset for a second here. But I will share my screen in a sec. That's pretty neat. Okay, here, sharing screen. And let's see here. Entire screen. All right, cool. So I'm going to just render this once. And then I'll go to the uh, the mask uh, to, to show you guys how that will work. Again, this is without the layer system uh, built in yet. So it's, it's all the backend is all ready. It's just the UI is not ready. So it's, that, that's kind of the, the cadence there. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, this will take a second here. Okay. So let's say that, uh, okay. Let's say I wanted to change the, uh, the sky, let's say. So if we added this and we just say, I'll kind of eat into it. And you could actually kind of draw here if you drag and click, let's leave it there. And that's a pretty, you know, funky master. Let's just say uh, night sky. All right, let's see what we get here. And I'll render that. And right now I didn't enable that that mask to be kind of feathered properly. So you'll see, you'll see what I mean uh, when it when it renders, uh, what the issue is. But we have this kind of currently in the, okay, there it is. So pretty, pretty rough <laughs> uh, there. But we have this uh, kind of feather where we could start to kind of feather that in. You can see here, like mm -hmm. I could go all the way to a hundred, but again, it's, it's early on. So this is getting there, but you can see here like how, how you want it to just further that ever so slightly that it looks like part of, so if I go back and forth, it looks a bit more correct. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah we could go here and actually keep a constant thing. Let's see here. So if I do this, say just red or red seems to give some interesting results sometimes. Like red architecture. Yeah. It's pretty decent right now. We're like around 15 seconds per render and at 1024 by 1024. And we're looking at um, getting that even even faster, a lot faster. Oh, looks like I didn't do it. But um, so if I look at this one, uh, actually, let me go back to this one. Yeah. So if I want to have a hard edge and then if I go all the way down, you can see that that's kind of exactly what that selection was mm -hmm. versus kind of blend, blend a little bit. Cool. Yeah. It's a lot of fun.
we're having fun all the time on playing with it, trying different uh, prompts and, and, and uh, exploring different projects, interiors, exteriors. I've seen some incredible interior renderings. Uh, I think you just posted on LinkedIn, you reposted somebody's post a day or two ago where they had never used a tool like this and they were just playing around with in some interiors of, I think it was like a living room. And it was yeah. like, and they, they were just completely blown away by what they were able to co-produce with a tool like this in such a short amount of time. And I think that's what's so exciting about this for people who try it out, who are willing to put in a little bit. I mean, it's literally like the least amount of effort you could do to get renderings, right? And and decent, yeah. really, really decent renderings. And and then therefore a direction, uh, you know, a, pot a potential emotional response, which then says, yes, that's the right direction. Let's go that direction. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. So I'm playing just with this kind of cabin interior here, uh, chair, you know, wood ceiling, but I'm using a prompt that's probably not the right one. So let's say we started to change it to something that's more. Also, we have this, um, I'll change the prompt soon, but we have this kind of slider here. So if you really want it to stay closer to the geometry that you have in your uh, model, you have this geometry override. If you go all the way out, it will really start to introduce other elements and can go a little bit more exploratory. Uh, and then we also have the, what's your override, which tries to keep, you know, the, when it's sketch up here, tries to keep the sketch up materials. Um, but yeah, let's, let's say if we, the issue with the, with the material override is just, it doesn't, um, the sketch up materials are not that great. So the more it blends with that, the, you know, but we're working on that, the, the less interesting it looks. Um, but yeah, let's say if I made this one, uh, let's say, uh, wood walls, wood walls, uh, wood ceiling, and then we'll leave everything else the same. Um. But yeah, I think I think that's one one thing that we've seen a lot too with frontiers because the tiers are usually hard, especially in traditional rendering, because you have global illumination that affects so many different surfaces and the way it blends. Like we're really good to pick up those inaccuracies, uh, whereas it, exteriors is a lot of times easier because it's like you know it's strong lit, you know, or, or harm lighting from sun, or even if it's soft lighting, like just the, the way you you know in traditional rendering, it, it's a bit easier to get to to, to the result there. Whereas interiors have all these, you know, subtle reflections and so many different uh, um, material interactions that start to, uh, you know, in traditional method is, is, is challenging. You have to be really good at and, and learn that process and, and, and craft that art uh, mm -hmm. to be produce decent results. What's the most kind of valuable feedback if you had to, you know, pick one or a top three of, from users as you've gone through this process, because it sounds like, I mean, this, this tool has just been out for a little more than a year at this point in yeah. being used by people. And obviously you're developing very quickly. It seems like I, I'm seeing you, you're available on a new platform. You've got selective replacements. You've got, you know, this new layering system. You've got all of this stuff that the geometry, you know, adhering to the geometry versus not, these are all things that have kind of shown up over the last year. What was a really valuable piece of feedback that you got along that path that, that really kind of maybe even changed how you thought about the direction that the development was going to go? I had like an answer for the first part that I'm not sure if I have the sentence. Let me, let me go with all the right. second answer. But for the first one, I think the biggest valuable feedback, which we're working on, uh, even with our layer system is just, uh, having control with the materials, like having more control with the materials. And and let's say if I want that to be wood, what color wood should that be mm. uh, specifically? So kind of getting a bit more, another level of finesse, like I want this product specifically. And so it comes in these three colors. Now there could be slight variations because of lighting will always kind of change the diffused color uh, of that. But that's something that's very evident that we, we see a lot of times, like, can we keep that material, uh, um, you know, more finesse? And then I guess, uh, another comment on that one is uh, being able to reproduce the same image more than once, which is kind of making it be used more as a traditional render. So if right. I wanted to change the angle ever so slightly, can I produce almost identical? And that's also something that we're, we're working on to get, get that better. Um, something that changed the development. Uh, I'm trying to think, I think, I don't know if I have a specific one, but a lot of them along the way have altered the development of the process, like from feedback that we've seen. Uh, we watch, you know, social media a lot. We see people that are posting on LinkedIn and, and, and Instagram and our forums. And so, uh, like we didn't think, I think one time, like we didn't have like portrait, be able to render like decent portrait aspect ratios. So that was something, okay. Yeah. That's something easy we could do. And, um, so we added that, 
Uh, but yeah, there's, I think, a lot of smaller, th- you know, kind of decisions that were made that were, uh, that started to craft the application more and more towards, you know, how, how people are using it. Can you talk about kind of the, because this, this operates very differently than a traditional CPU or GPU based renderer where it's happening locally mm-hmm. on the hardware yeah. that I have, right? Versus this where it's sending a prompt out. There's an exchange of information happening um, with the the model that you're using and the base image that I'm sending to it. Talk about like what that what that's been like for you because the, this is very different than the traditional sense of like what I need on my end to do a rendering versus a, a tool like this and and how you guys have kind of navigated that because this is this is a new paradigm when it comes to delivering images based on my model. For sure, yeah. So the way it's set up is it's cloud-based, the processing. So, you know, your model stays on your machine. It doesn't use your CPU or GPU uh, on your lo- local machine, but it gets in up to the cloud. We render it in our GPU instances, and then we send it back to your uh, local machine. Uh, so that's kind of the, the main setup for this. Now, we do have uh, enterprise clients that want to use this for more sensitive projects, and they just don't want to have a connection to the internet while using it. And so we are working on a, a local deployment. So then if you know if you have server racks and you're, you're a company that has a few different uh, GPUs that can power it, then uh, that's also something that we've, we're working with a few different actually companies that uh, want to have that local deployment. So what's nice about that is that, you know, the, those companies that kind of need that sensitivity to, to explore is behind their kind of, you know, uh, intranet or their, their uh, system. And so that they're networking and doesn't kind of, you know, leave that. Um, so yeah, that, that's how it's, and even with that setup though, it's still not on your client, it's on a local server. So you have like mm-hmm. a local server system that, you know, load balances your requests and then sends back in whoever's using it. Um, cause it's really nice to not have to have that, um, that on-prem setup right on the client side. Cause then it's, it's like 30 gigabytes of just data just to, or for one of installation, for example, where you have that. Uh, if you have it on on your know, GPU instances, then it's you know it's more manageable, and then you have you know your lighter clients be able to. You can even use you know um, a thin client to to just do anything because just you receive the images and you interact with it that way. I I, I don't know if you guys have done any kind of calcs based on that, but it seems to me like that even is a a, a valuable selling point to a firm who if you know, everybody's got to balance hardware spend, you know, capital yes. expenses yes. versus this kind of thing, and to give people. <laughs> Um, the ability to have, like you said, a really thin client, like to, you could have an iPad potentially, right? That that you're, exactly. you, you're, you're running SketchUp on your iPad, you pull up a view and you say, send this to, to Varus and you get something back and, and you're not spending $5,000 on the highest end laptop with GPU, you know, with an RTX card, you, you've got an iPad, right? And, and you could effectively, you know, in front of a client, be coming up with this kind of prompt-based imagery, getting real-time feedback from anywhere in the world. I mean, that's that's got to be a, an interesting, uh, that's got to pique a leader's interest when it comes to like what they need to outfit their staff with. Right. Yeah, it's, it's really it's really nice. I mean, if you do have the resources, you could do it and you can you know, invest in the hardware and the commercial grade hardware that we, we use like is pretty expensive. Mm-hmm. So you have to be very uh, like committed to that. Like, yes, we're doing this. We're going to buy a few of these and it's going to stay in our temperature controlled server room and, you know, uh, everyone's going to connect to it uh, versus, yeah, like you said, like, um, you know, if you use the cloud instances, then it's, you know, it's, it's very convenient to mm-hmm. not have to, and, uh, you know, have that kind of hardware, you know, locally. Do you have any stories who's, you don't have to say who it was, but who's created them? What's the number of images that, you know, somebody has generated a single person with this? Oh, I don't know. It's so we do collect like analytics, but it's. But it's an- anonymous, so we don't know who, which is obviously. Uh, but again, I haven't monitored that recently. I'm, I'm sure maybe Bill or, or someone else will know more uh, than Brun. Uh, but yeah, I think it's. I'd, I'd have to check. I think it's in the thousands. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think I think per month we get. I'm trying to think. Like half a million, maybe renders or something like that. Yeah. It's pretty wow. Pretty fun, yeah. Yeah, so we also have our free trial too, so people kind of explore that. Uh, so they play with that. So a lot of users, um, you know, have fun with it that way. Well, is there anything behind the scenes that you could 
maybe talk about here when it came to how you thought through the process of of this? You mentioned you might have some mirror boards or something. I'm just wondering if, if there's anything back there that you could show that kind of talks about how you handle internal development. Yeah, I was thinking about the mirror boards. Uh, I think more in the context maybe of, of local deployment and that setup. So I don't know if that is, you know, that that interesting right now but essentially like i think i already talked about it like essentially okay. you have the client and then you have the the instances um yeah dev process wise we're we're a small team we're uh nine uh we kind of our, our dev team is kind of structured like a scrum team so we do agile uh, we have sprints um we uh have internal releases more often than than because you know some of these initiatives are a bit uh more uh ambitious so we don't have a we haven't had a release uh a major release actually no we did we had the vector works one very recently so shouldn't say that we had that was that was, that was we had, didn't have one in january i think uh, we always have patches so we always kind of release the smaller patches i think last year we had a lot of iterations like almost every month we had like a, a really big release uh right now i think one thing that we've worked on from the dev side which was a challenge is uh uh just like working with certain applications that um are a bit harder like harder apis uh, for example, Vectorworks is in C++. So that's like something that, like, you know, is, is a harder language to code in. Mm. And then documentation might not be the best documentation. So, uh, but it was, it was really great. Like it was a very good collaboration with, uh, w- with their team. Um, we also have like a SDK that, sorry, I was kind of blabbering on. I'm just trying to think about uh, kind of how we're set up and what we've done recently, uh, where we, with our SDK, we can actually implement Veras as a separate application within your web, app, web application. We're working with, with a few different um, parties that built their own uh, formal like application that they use internally. And so if you wanted to, you could add Veras as an extension to that. I could actually show you what that looks like. It looks pretty, pretty cool. Uh, let me see here. Sorry if I'm rambling on here. No, no bit. worries. Uh, but so this is, a, um, this is online. So anyone has access to this. Uh, and he's a he's a live demo of it. So this is just a quick little application that we uh, uh, put together. You could just it's like a little uh, sketch tool, uh, and you no, know, this could be you know someone else's sketch tool. And if you uh, start Verus, it opens up Verus in a separate window uh, that is kind of linked to uh, you know it's, it's the same application. And then you can start to render within that uh, as an extension. You know, and this could be your own three D view or your own application that you're doing something or a sketch application. But it loads it as an extension to your own application. That's just like a few lines of code that you have to add, and you you get you know the application. This was inspired with the uh, from the Forma collaboration. So Forma has has an extension, and it's fully a web app, and you could just open a Forma, open up your project and extensions. You click Veras, and it's in there. Uh, so yeah, this is a uh, let's see what setting am I using? Let's use this one. This one's better. Um, so yeah, but like going back to our kind of team makeup. Uh, so we're we're pretty small we're very nimble and uh yeah we have fun we're excited with what we do every day when you approach these these companies like like vectorworks and you know i would assume that there's some excitement that you're coming to them saying we want to build on top of what you've got we want to talk we want to get your users involved in this what what is that what's that process like yeah it's really organic actually i think we uh, I connected to all the social media. It's like, hey, you guys are doing cool things. Let's just talk. And then we met in person at AIA. Uh, when, when I met you guys too, actually, in person. Mm-hmm. So that was great. And that's when we're talking with the Vec- Vectorworks team. And it was just a really good collaboration, like really good synergy. And like, uh, we like their their personality, their culture, and uh, we wanted to work with them. So this was a really good like I- engagement. Uh, and so, yeah, we just set up, you know, channels to, to talk with one another. And we've, uh, they've helped us through the process as like, I'm not a Vectorworks user, so I don't, I'm like, I'm learning the interface. And, you know, I, not only do I not know that, I, I know the API even less. Uh, so uh, it, it was, it was really good. Um, with the format team was also a really good engagement. Like we, um, I think they've added things because it was pretty early on. They've added things to their API to allow things for us to work together, which is really exciting because it's like, we're both building these cars at the same time and we want to make them both call, uh, talk to one another. Uh, so that was, that was, that was really fun. Um, but yeah, it's very organic. Like I think, uh, um, I met with, uh, quite a few people there with, you know, just going to conferences and talking to people and say, Hey, like, Hey, you do this cool thing. We're doing this cool thing. Uh, we should talk. Yeah, let's talk. 
And so, uh, yeah, we connected and then uh, we, you know, took that conversation online and we, we made something happen. It's right in line with what something Randall said in the last episode with Steve Germano, Randall, right? Because Steve was at Unify and, and you said what people always ask, like, aren't, aren't you guys right. competitors? And you said, we all yeah. we all know each other. We all like each other. And I mean, just to kind of like, what you're saying is really reinforcing something that Randall mentioned in the last one, which is like this is a community and, and we're interested in the AEC getting better. Right. And and it's, it really sounds like like people are interested in working together and, and forging new pathways together, collaborations, things like that to, to really make make things better for everybody. Yeah. And that's exciting to me. It's like that's so great. That's like the world I want to be in. Uh, where people crab will no don't like always just compete and try to kind of up one each other. It's like actually yes, the synergistic approach where actually one plus one equals three. Uh so I, I, I've been very fortunate and uh you know that we've got to collaborate with these amazing people. Well I think the uh, I think the tech stacks have as they've matured have allowed more and more, right, of more easily moving data in and out, right? Having APIs you know, using JSON or some other, you know, yep. you know sim simpler ways to move data around from these applications and workflows. Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, big conducive, I think, more and more for yeah. these to begin collaborating. Yeah, that was a very intentional thing too, because we're traditionally like Revit C sharp developers. Like we use WPF and and for most of our Revit add-ins, uh, you know, because part of our company also does services, uh, app application development services. And that's kind of our stack. Uh, and so with Helix, which was a SketchUp integration, that's where we start to migrate away from that to web, web stack. And with web stack right now, with what we what we see here in the demo on the screen, we don't have to do anything. You could just actually load this up if you have a web app without even like contacting us. You could just copy those snippets of code in your application and you have it. Like it's that easy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, yeah, we're really... We were very intentional about that because we're seeing how a lot of things are moving towards that way. And it's very modular, very uh, contained so that you can actually have these pieces that are part of, you know, you could build a larger application of sea of applications together. It's a mosaic of apps by building it this way and having kind of almost the same kind of, you know, web stack. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that is that is something that we're seeing and it's actually exciting. It's really cool that a lot of applications are moving uh, to the web. So how many, how many people, Ben, did you say are working on this particular product? Uh, so we're four, uh, working on, 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 on the, on the product. Good, tight, good, tight yep. team. Right. Yep. It's, it's one of those, uh, you know, if you, if you've ever been in software development, you know, sometimes four people can get more done than 40. Right. And it's, it's like, interesting. It, you just I think our speed spot might be around like 10 or 20. Yeah. Like as soon as you, and what I've seen, it's like, once you go beyond that, it's like, there's yeah, more it's breakers dope. and accelerators. Yeah. No, you guys are familiar then, with no. with Brooks Law. Have you heard of Brooks Law? You look at it. I'll put a link to it in the show yeah. notes from Wikipedia. But yeah. yeah, it's like how many people are on your team? If if you have if you have two people, right, the line of communication is That's just cool. back and forth. If you you have a third person, right, we have we have two more lines of communication. If you have four people, now now we start getting a little crazy, right? And it right. just gets crazier and crazier right. and crazier. Right. Like Randall's forty people. The cross product. Like, you imagine right. what my diagram would look like with forty people. It would be right. it would be insane. And just managing that is yeah becomes the job. I, I just talking about yeah. this on another podcast. Yes. Just email like in one day, two hundred and thirty six emails. If leadership of a company knew how much time people were spending just fielding emails, and that's just one piece, right? It's incredible. Wouldn't you rather have people on your staff? playing with a tool like this, doing something valuable on a project rather than fielding email, right? And, and so it, it is like, it's a crazy thing. So that's, that's amazing that you're building this yeah. tool with four people and to see how fast you're releasing new features, bug fixes, it's, yeah. it's absolutely it's so cool. Yeah, we literally see like when we have one person on the project, uh, like let's say it's 100%, that's the baseline. When you add two people, it's already at like, 150 each, that's 300% output. Just mm -hmm. because of that, like, actually, like, you build on one another and you encourage one another. Just having two. Three becomes, like, 100% again, all of them. Four becomes 80% everyone or 90% everyone. And it just like, kind of starts to go lower. But you're still getting 90% of every single person, yeah. which is way more than three one, still yeah, because of the right. way it compounds. Or not compounds, but the way it kind of adds up. So, mm -hmm. but at a certain level, it's like, 
you're like you said earlier, like, you're spending yeah. time, a full time job, just communicating, just getting everyone you know, and different emotions, different, you know, everyone's very passionate and, and love the project. And, you know, there's when you're, you know, super passionate about something, you all have different ideas, and different opinions. You have to, you know, okay, well, let's try this one, which is good. Actually, we like that friction. We like to have a little bit of friction because it kind of lets the best idea win. But when it gets to a certain size, then it gets like, okay, well, we can't get things done as, as, as fast as we'd like to get them done. So, yeah. And there's the other parts of everyone's life that works its way into what we do, right? There's, there's the, the emergencies, there's the kids, there's the school, there's the lunches, there's everything, there's drama and, and all that is right. a piece of that as well. And it, it's big, a part yeah. of that soup for sure. <laughs> yeah. We're all human. Great. Well, it's been great, Ben. Uh, appreciate your being able to share, you know, obviously a lot of people have seen the output, but you know, what we like to do on this podcast is give a little bit of the behind the scenes and the backstory for how all of this came about. So we really appreciate your uh, willingness to share. Of yeah. course. Pleasure. So we'll put links to Evolve Lab, Varus in the show notes. Ben, I'll put a link to your uh, LinkedIn so people can follow you. And uh, I'll encourage everyone to, again, look up the hashtag Varus AI, Varus Render. You mentioned a couple of them earlier. Um, I think that would be eye-opening for people to see the kinds of output that people are producing with a tool like this. And it, uh, thanks so much for sharing. I'll just echo what Randall just said, just to, to take us behind the scenes and, and get into it. I think I even learned a few things just watching you use the tool today that I nice. probably wouldn't awesome. have picked up on my own. So another benefit for uh, people watching this episode. So and thank we you. should uh, we should mention, I don't know if we're going to get Ben over for the Confluence event that we're going to do in New York City on April 17th, the one day event, but it is around AI and machine learning. So this is right up the alley. So we'll twist your arm, Ben, and, and hope to see you there or other members of your team. And then uh, hopefully anybody in the uh, in that region or in that area will be able to to come and learn that day because we'll have uh, several people. Uh, the, the speakers will be starting to be announced here in the next couple of weeks. So by the time this podcast nice. come out, you'll be able to check out who all uh, you can come and meet and greet and have uh, just deeper conversations around these topics. Yeah, we'll have a link to that event in the show notes as well so people can click on that and learn more. Uh, and uh, yeah, it would be great to see everyone who's really interested in this kind of work show up and, and be in the room for, for what's going to happen at that event. So. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap this one up. Thanks again, everybody. This was a fantastic conversation. Thanks, guys.